back with their stuffed animals. <laughs> I wish I could see like what, what kinds you have. So hello, museum families, and welcome to Royal B uh, RBCM at Home Kids, a play date through screens across British Columbia and the world. The previous sessions are recorded and you can find them on our Royal BC Museum YouTube page. So definitely check it out. We're now up to, I, I should count it, but I think we're up to like 16 uh, uh, episodes. So my name is Chris O'Connor and I'm a pro learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum. The museum and my home is on the, the territory of Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt nations here uh, in Victoria on Vancouver Island. Now, if you have never been to the Royal BC Museum, know that it's an amazing place with galleries that will make you feel like you're in the forest, make you feel like you're back in time in an old town, make you feel like you're down in a mine with the sounds and the lights, um, make you feel like you're at a seashore and you could almost like go swimming. Um, and there's lots to see. And so a reminder, we are opening back up on Friday, which is really exciting. Uh, for a limited number of people at one time, um, but we're, uh, we're opening up on Friday and we're really excited about that. But there's a whole other world um, to the museum and that's behind the scenes. Like here, I'm in the lab space uh, of the curator of vertebrate zoology, Dr. Gavin Henke. He's not here right now, so we could have proper social distancing, um, but he let me spend, he's letting me spend some time in his office here, which is also a lab space. And he has some odd things here. So snakes and orcas and lizards, oh my. But this is just one room of many in a tower beside the museum. And within the tower are millions of specimens, objects, belongings, documents, photographs, all helping to us understand this world we live in just a little bit better. Going behind the scenes is the theme today. So. So uh, get ready. Um, but first, let's go back to last week where we had a session with Heidi Gardner. And Heidi Gardner is our uh, collection manager of uh, invertebrate zoology. So I'm going to pull up this. If you've joined us before, you know. Um, so this is our RBCM at home kids. And last week, oops, last week um, we made. Sea do uh, deep sea doodles. And Heidi was showing us some of the things that you would see deep down in the sea, and especially in this really interesting area that are by hydrothermal vents. Um, so really hot steam coming up and the things that like to be around that. So we have um, some of, and actually one, one of the families actually made a little diorama um, of, of it too. And so these are some of the, some of the art that I, I received. We'd love to see your sketches that you make today. Um, so please share your art with us or with me. So my email is coconnor at royalbcmuseum.bc.ca and I'll put it in the chat and Wes, if you could put it in the comments in Facebook Live. You could share it through our socials channels. So at Royal BC Museum or hashtag RBCM Kids. And actually last week it was Oceans Week Victoria. So if you wanted to see some of the things that were happening last week around Oceans Week Victoria, then you could check out that hashtag too. Keep exploring after this session. We have our learning portal, which is a really dynamic way to learn uh, online, whether you're in Victoria or further uh, afield. Um, so you could Google uh, learning portal and Royal BC Museum. And then next week, we have insect camouflage with Dr. Uh, Joel Gibson. So that insect is camouflaging itself <laughs> with the, the, the grass and then Joel is camouflaging himself behind the, the insect. <laughs> so um, Joel was with us one, one of the first weeks and he's coming back to talk about insect camouflage. All right, we are back now. So um, just a little bit of a, um, just a little bit of an understanding of what this is. So in this format, you could see me and your host and our special guests each week. And today we have Chelsea and Bob. Um, though we can't see you, we can hear from you. You have used the Q&A box or the comments section if you're watching on Facebook Live. So please ask questions as we go along. And heads up, we'll do some sketching later, just at the very end of the session. Um, so you'll need some paper and something to draw with. Um, so um, if 
you have that ready, that would be great. But we're also recording the session, so if you need to take a break and you need more time to gather materials, you can just play it again later. The most important thing is to be good to yourself and to others during this time. Do things at your own pace. So let's meet our special guests today. We have Chelsea Clark and Bob Clark. These lovely people uh, volunteer at the Royal BC Museum, both in the galleries and behind the scenes. And they use their skills to interact with the public and help the public learn about science. And they both actually do science behind the scenes. And I'm so happy to have you both here, uh, Chelsea and Bob, you're our second family grouping of, uh, for one of these sessions. So it's so nice to have you here. And um, is there, would there be other ways that you would describe the, the two of you? I think that's perfect. I, I'm sure there are a lot of people here who are also with a parent. So I'm here with my dad and we really enjoy doing these sorts of things together. We did when I was a kid and even now that I'm a grown up, we're still exploring science together, still yeah. learning together. He's still learning too. That's right. We still <laughs> yeah. can't get her out of our BC museum. <laughs> right. So Chelsea, you when you were growing up, you, you would go to the Royal BC Museum? All the time. I loved the woolly mammoth. I, you know, the tidal pool, I still have my favorites that I remember from when I was a kid and my mom and dad would take me in there. So it's so, since we're talking about being behind the scenes, it's so magical to have a lifetime of experience in a place and then kind of get to explore it even deeper in a way I didn't even know or think about when I was a kid, all of that stuff that goes into making it a museum. Okay. Oh, great. So um, you both work both in the gallery and behind the scenes. What do you do behind the scenes? And I think that would lead into what we might be doing today. Yeah, sure. We'd love to talk about what we're doing today. So when we are behind the scenes, we both have a different role working in the uh, small mammals and birds preparation lab. So we both do something different and we can both talk a bit about what we do in there. But kind of to back up, we'll talk a little bit about what goes on in the natural history collection at the museum. So when we talk about the museum and I already brought up the something like a, the big woolly mammoth and a lot of the times natural history galleries like ours will have deer and bear and cougar and all of these animals. And when we describe those animals and see them, they're taxidermied animals, which is a very fancy way of saying they were once alive and they're made to look like they're still alive. They look very, very realistic and like they might even crawl out of the museum at some time. But what's really interesting about museums is that that is only a very small part of what a museum does and has in terms of animals. Actually, Chelsea, I could quickly show a taxidermy. Oh, wonderful. Okay. I'm actually gonna grab, I have some taxidermy tongues. Okay. The advantage of being in a in behind the scenes. So Ooh, beauty. So this is a, a rock ptarmigan. And it it was alive and it's no longer alive, but it was made to look like it's it's just hanging out on this. It's actually like a piece of wood. So a rock ptarmigan. Very real, very realistic. Like it could fly away at any moment. And, and I it's like gonna to fly away. Yeah, bye. I like to show, so something with taxidermy that's used to make the animal look alive is plastic tongues, things that might be added to the animal. So this is not real, but it sure looks real. So this is a tongue that would be used in a bear, in, a, in an animal that's taxidermy. It, the first time I saw this, I thought it was real, but it's just plastic. <laughs> so that's something that is a taxidermy. So you can imagine, it takes a lot of work to make an animal look like it's still alive. And it also takes a lot of space. That was a pretty, pretty big display that you just shared. So the reality is at the museum, the majority, so for about every 10 animals the museum gets, only one is gonna be taxidermied or even less, which means the other nine are something called study specimens. We turn into study specimens. I'm gonna show you what those are. So we have a study specimen right here and right away, you're gonna notice it does not look like it's going to jump up and run off anywhere. You might notice it's a little bit flat. 
<laughs> you might notice it's a little bit stiff. I don't know, what else do you notice about this? No tongue, no, no tongue, glass eyes. No glass eyes. No. no. I'm wondering if anyone in the Zoom room or Facebook Live could guess what this, what this kind of animal is. I'm gonna show you the belly. I'm gonna say the belly is a good hint. This might help you get more specific about what it could be. It's a little harder to tell what it is when it looks like this. So Tannis says a marmot, question mark. Yes. Very good, Tannis. That's and so my hint about the kind of marmot is it's a yellow-bellied marmot. So you can see it's got kind of a yellow fur. As opposed to, so this is a book actually published through the Royal BC Museum on uh, rodents. And this guy here is our Vancouver Island marmot. So you can see the markings are a little different. And I'll sh let you show the yellow one. Yeah, so this is our yellow-bellied marmot. Yeah, so these, this guy is quite rare on our Vancouver Island. There's probably 300, 350 in the wild, kind of up in the middle of our Vancouver Island. Lots of these. Lots of these we guys. Lots of yellow. Which um, also Kelowna. brings me to when, a, when an animal comes into the museum, all of the animals at the Royal BC Museum, as with many museums around the world are by donation. So there might be something you find in the side of the road or a bird that flew into your window, or if someone is working in pest control, they might donate to the museum. So there's lots of ways the museum now collects and takes animals in. And so you might be wondering why most of the animals look like this instead of like that beautiful ptarmigan we saw at the beginning. And the reality is, Space is a big part of it. Yeah. Can you imagine if they all looked realistic or if they all had their wings out or their claws up? We would need three or four museums just to store everything. So do you mind maybe showing the birds? We can kind of show how birds are stored in order to store um, with the photo too. That would be great. Oh, okay. Yeah, we can kind of show. So this is an example of how many, this is just one species of one bird that we might have all together. And if they all had their wings out and looked ready to fly away, it'd be really hard to store them all. So a study specimen, we keep all the information from that animal because we want to learn everything we can, but it just doesn't look quite as impressive. So this is a way a bird might be stored too. I'll let you hold the bird up. You might want to. Mm -hmm. Does anyone? Is, is it on a stick? It is. And that just helps us put it into the, um, into the shelving where it's all archived or kept. That big building, the tower that you referred to, so that is full of all these specimens. And it can be natural history, it can be fish, it can be human history. So whole floors are full of these, these specimens that we collect so that we have this, uh, all this information and all the information we collect before we even prepare them as study specimens for the future and for scientists to, to look at now. So yeah, you, you might have mentioned this, but what, what kind of bird is that? I haven't yet, but can anybody guess? There's, there's a marking there that might help uh, indicate. And look at that beak. That beak is really good for zooming down into water and catching fish. So this is a belted kingfisher. Hmm. Very common here belt. in Victoria. Yeah. Where we're talking to you from. So with every animal that comes to the museum that's turned into a study specimen, it goes on a journey. And the very first step I refer to as homework for me, because it's not my favorite step, but I'd say it's probably the most important. So when an animal comes in, hold that. The first thing we gotta do, and this is something if you would like to do at home, you can also do with your stuffed animal, is measuring. So I measure, I use my ruler, I even have a form here. You can see that asks me all the measurements of the tail, the foot, the ear, <laughs> the eyes, everything it wants to know. And the reason why we wanna know, and you might notice if you do this at home, is you learn so much just from taking some measurements and basic observations. So if I'm measuring, I might notice, wow, its ears are bigger than its eyes. And that's gonna tell me something about what it does in the wild. Or maybe its eyes are bigger than its ears. Or maybe I can't find its ears. What am, what am I gonna learn about the animal that way? 
or does it have a tail? How long is its tail? So I measure everything and guess what? I don't just do it once, I don't just do it twice, I do it three times because I wanna make sure I get it right. Other things we'll do is weigh the animal to see how heavy it is. We'll see what color the fur is, write down the fur, the color, the texture, how it feels. I'll get to that next. <laughs> Um, all of those different parts. Its feet, that's another one. Maybe I'll measure its claws. Does it have claws? What can I learn about the animal by seeing if it has claws or not? So those are all things you can do too to learn at home about your animal if you want to take some measurements and see. You might notice something you've never noticed before about a very familiar stuffed animal. So, so so Chelsea, uh, and Tanis has a question saying like, once you're writing, you're writing down the measurements, mm -hmm. are you also writing down what you're inferring from that? So if you- Oh, that's such like, a good question. So we typically don't. Typically we just write down the basic information and we leave that to the scientists and other researchers who would take that information and then do something like write the book that my dad showed. So they get to kind of put that information together. We're just taking the notes, basically. It's a great question. But you're, a cu you're curious people, so you're, so you're always curious. wondering, right? Exactly, we're very curious and we'll talk about it. And we both have a different role in the lab. So um, my role's first, and then I'll let dad take over. And that's when I, first step is gonna skin the animal. So I would use um, this would normally have a blade in it, but for safety, it doesn't. And I would take the pelt off. So we call it a pelt when we remove the skin and the fur. And that's the first step for any animal, or in the case of a bird, the skin and the feather. So we would skin the animal. And then two different journeys happen. There's a pelt and there's a body. So the body, we're going to take some more samples from to learn before we take care of the pelt. We might take a sample of the heart. What have we taken samples of? Liver. Liver. Mm -hmm. Yep, different yep. parts of the insides. And then we would take the body, and this is my favorite part. We need to get at the bones now. We've learned what we can from its meat and its organs, and the next thing we want to do is get at the bones. That could be a lot of work if we didn't have help. So we have help. We have a whole colony of beetles that live in the basement. And I'll let you think for a moment about why they would live in the basement, because it's for a very good reason. But these beetles are called dermistead beetles. And they're also commonly nicknamed, they're very small, they're commonly nicknamed museum beetles, because this is a pretty common practice for a lot of museums around the world. So these are adults, and I'll let you hold up. And what these beetles do is eat the meat. They love it. They're very happy to eat all the meat and clean the bones for us. We're very happy that they do it for us too. It's a very nice thing. These are the larvae, the baby beetles. They do most of the eating. So they will eat and eat and eat and they will clean those bones for us. They will get all the meat off. And the other thing they do is poop. So they will eat and they will poop. We are scientists, so we have a special word for beetle poop. We call it frass. If you would like to use a fancy word, you can say frass. And when the beetles are done eating all that meat off the bone, we get to take over again. And I'll let my dad talk about what he does after the beetles have done their job. And I'm just wondering if anyone has, I'll let you know why. Someone asked, why do you think the beetles in the basement? I don't know. If those beetles eat meat, what do you think might happen if they got out and into our collections? If they like to eat things like fur? What if, oh, they also eat paper? They would eat everything. We wouldn't have a museum left. We would all of our beautiful collections. So they're behind a pretty heavy door down in the basement, keeping them. And I see someone saying dark and damp. Yep, they like it in the dark. They're very happy down there. We're very happy that they're down there. So and, when and one of the things that I know, Chelsea and Bob, is that because they do all that great work, it also smells um, a lot. So it's, it's good that way too, that it's down in the basement, sort of away from where people are working, because it's not, it's not the best smell. I, I totally agree. That's right. So when we go get the bones down in the basement, each of the uh, specimens have been put in a 
box, usually a little plastic box like this. And for, for demonstration, this is actually clean sawdust. It's not that brass that Chelsea was talking about. So that way this doesn't smell at all. So all these bones and here's, here's the head or the skull of a marmot. They'll come up in that box and then that's my job. I'll do the uh, cleaning of the bones. And like Chelsea says, the beetles do such a fantastic job that my, it makes my job so much easier. I'll use, look at this high tech device we have in the, in the lab. I bet you, you, you guys have one of these, don't you? So this is a toothbrush and literally what we'll do is if, if the bones are still a little bit dirty, we'll use toothbrushes to clean them all. So what I want to get to is a nice, clean box of bones. And Chelsea's clean, er, uh, creating a nice, clean study skin. So both of those items, and we, we make sure they're both referenced to each other, will go into that big tower on one of the floors, the floors that had the mammals, and it's just like a big library where scientists and people who are studying these things can go and they can pull out the bones or they could pull out the study skin. And of course, all that information has been collected. So, and what I like to show, because Chelsea and I will do this in the museum as well. We go to the museum and we have a little cart with some of these items so that we can show our visitors and kids. But this bone here is a leg bone. This is a, what's called a femur, and that's part of the hip. What I like to show folks is this is a marmot bone. Look how tiny it is, but that little bone is shaped exactly like mine, and I'm six foot three, but we have the same shape because we're both mammals. And look at that. I don't know if you can see that, but you can see how all that works. So That's how that marmot would use its legs. Yeah. Just like us. Yeah. So um, I'm, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm an older guy, but I still love to learn. And like Chris said, I'm very curious. That's why Chelsea and I are still volunteering yeah. at museums. So I love to, to um, study those bones and look at them and, just get to that point where we have a nice clean box. I forgot to show you how we label the bones. So this is a label for the bones and you'll notice it is not made out of paper. If we labeled the bones with paper, the beetles would eat the label and we just get a pile of bones and say, what is this? We wouldn't know, we'd have to guess. So we have to make sure that we label with something that the beetles won't actually eat. We only want them to eat the meat. So we make sure to do that. So once the bones are clean, I'm going to go back and take care of the pelt. So this is another really interesting thing that I like to do. I need to clean the pelt because animals are wild. I want to make sure it's nice and clean. They might be a bit dirty. And there's also one more thing that we can learn about this animal. And I'm going to give you a hint at home. You might be able to guess what else can I learn about this marmot from this pelt. What else is there? I'm gonna give you, this is my hint. It's bugs. Every, I see someone <laughs> says lice, yeah. yep. Every single animal we've ever had in the lab, I don't think we've ever met an animal that didn't have bugs living on it. They're their own ecosystem. So I'm gonna collect the bugs. This is a jar of tiny, you might not even be able to see them, tiny, tiny, tiny little bugs. Mites, ticks, parasites, lice, they all have some living on them. And the museum is full of scientists. We all wanna learn. This could be something you do someday. Maybe you're more interested in the little insects that live on the marmot. So that's something that we would make sure we took note of too. So I would very carefully wash the animal, collect a sample of all of those small animals, and then I would move on to making the pelt. And in order to do that, I would need to dry 
the pelt. So just like we were talking about those fancy equipment of toothbrushes, this is something we really do use in the lab. This is something you might have in your kitchen. It's a salad spinner. So for a small pelt, like I worked on a, fair, um, a weasel, we might put it right in here. So a marmot is an example of a small pelt. This is a way I can dry it without overhandling it. So since it's fur, I don't want to mess that up too much. So I would spin my salad spinner. Just like you might dry your salad leaves and dry off the animal's pelt, its skin and fur. So for a big animal that would not fit in a salad spinner, we have a really neat mechanical one, kind of like a big mechanical salad spinner that spins everything over and over, kind of like a dryer, just to get it all nice and dry. We've also used um, hair blow dryers mm -hmm. in, in the lab. So very inventive, right? We'll use whatever's around, whatever we can think of that might make it easier. So after that, now we've got a full picture of the animal. We have the bones, we have the insects that were living on it. We know about its organs. We know what it might have been eating. Ooh, that's another interesting one we didn't even mention. Stomach contents. You can learn so much about an animal from what's in its stomach, and we even have an example of that. Maybe hard to see, but this is from the stomach of a sharp shin hawk and they like to eat little birds. And right at the bottom of this little vial is a little, you can see the little feet. <laughs> so, but now we know that that sharp chin hawk was, was uh, eating well and it, in its natural habitat. So we can, we can learn a lot. Yeah. And unfortunately we might even find plastic mm -hmm. or things that you don't want to find, but it tells us that story. Yeah, it's all good information. That's the thing. I think when you're practicing science, there's no such thing as bad information. We want to learn everything. And so now that- Chelsea and Bob, just to let you know, we just have a few more, few more minutes. Perfect, because this is the last step. So I go back to all those notes I took earlier because I want to, when I put it together as a study specimen, um, I want to make sure that I'm getting all the measurements right. So all we do for a study specimen, since it's not a taxidermy animal, we don't want it to look too impressive. We're saving space. All we put in there is some cotton. So when you hold it, if you ever come to the museum and see our cart, you can pet it. You'll feel it's really light. There's not much going on in there, but just some cotton. But I'll make sure that as I'm stuffing it and laying it out, I keep measuring it again and again, checking my notes, measuring, checking my notes so that when a scientist comes back and wants to learn more, it fits the notes I took so that they all match up. And that's the very last step. And then it goes into our collections, which is basically, like you said, a large library of animals and other specimens. And that's the whole journey that an animal would go on from beginning to end at the museum. And then, and <laughs> once, then. so, so the, um, that happens on the main floor of the museum. And then it comes up into the different floors of the tower, as I was mentioning earlier. Um, and the tower, has lots of different things. And so uh, Chelsea and Bob were, were showing the marmot, um, but I am going to show, and I don't know, Kim, if you have it uh, spotlighted other video, but if you can spot. So, so this is, this is not a marmot. <laughs> it's, significant, it's significantly larger than a marmot. Um, so any guesses from, from out in Zoom room or Facebook Live world, what kind of animal might this be? Something you would find in, in uh, BC. Hmm. It has really big teeth. That might tell us something about what it could be. Those, hmm. those are some big teeth. Ah, so oh. we have one guess, a lynx. We have another guess of a cougar. Any other guesses? Good guesses. So Ellen, yeah, Tana said some sort of big cat. Ellen A said uh, cougar and the cougar is the right answer. So this is a cougar skull. 
So if, you, if you're going to do the process that um, Chelsea and Bob were talking about, it would be a lot harder with a cougar because it's a much bigger animal. Yes. But it would be more or less the same. It just would take a lot longer. And the beetles would take a lot longer to eat all that meat too. Yeah. They'd need more even, even, there's probably as much sort of bone just in the skull with the, compared to the whole body of the marmot. So if you can, just in the last two minutes, if you can look at this, I'll hold this still, but if you can look at this cougar skull and try to sketch it, like how would you sketch this? Mm. So maybe um, Bob and Chelsea, if you can describe it a little bit more, just so as people are sketching it while I'm pulling it up. And I think sketching sketch is such a great way to learn that something that scientists still do. It's one of the earlier ways before we had photography that a lot of scientists would learn about something. You learn a lot about something by sketching it. You start asking questions like if I'm drawing. I'm sorry, sorry, Chelsea. I'm just going to, um, Kim, if you can spotlight my video just while Chelsea is speaking, just so people can still see the skull. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, because as I'm drawing, I'm realizing I would notice how sharp those teeth look like they look like a pointed triangle. I might notice as I'm drawing how, look, do you see how wide the chamber is for the nose? So that might tell us something about how this animal uses its nose. I'm thinking of different, you know, comparing it to different animals I've seen. Did it have bigger or smaller teeth? I might notice where the eye socket is for this animal. So just by drawing a picture, we're learning so much about something. We might be, we might even be interested to put the clothes, to put the fur back on this cougar as we're drawing it and see what can we learn. Because when I look at it, I think of, you know, the rest of the nose that, that's cartilage, just like us, not bone, and where that would go. What, what would that change with the structure of this cougar? What does its tongue look like? because that's something we would have to add in. So there's so many neat things we can learn about this animal just from a drawing. And especially in a museum of things that you might, you maybe will never see. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> if you see it, it's from a distance um, that at a museum, you could have a closer look at it. Mm -hmm. And I, I always think when I'm looking at it closely and I start sketching, I start seeing things that I didn't see when I was beginning. Mm. And even in terms of shapes, like the nose cavity, I'm seeing, and maybe it's just me, but I'm seeing kind of an, a heart shape. I see that too. Yeah. yeah. So, or like I, as I'm sketching the teeth, I realize just how big they are. And maybe yeah, like I would think of that before, but sketching it would actually make it so, so. Um, so just uh, 30 more seconds of sketching this, and then I'm going to put it down, <laughs> and then come back to the museum and sketch other bones, because it's, it's really fascinating. You can spend hours just sketching um, bones in the collection here, because there's and so many different shapes and so many different marks. We have a setup in the um, natural history gallery of um, the bones of a great blue heron that's a little station oh, yeah. where that's you can great. sit and sketch. We yeah. set it up specifically so that a person could do that. For sure. Yeah. Great. So um, we'd love, again, we'd love to see what your sketch looks like. So, and I know Bob and Chelsea would love to see that as well. So sure. I'm just going to write into the chat um, my email address 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 again and um, just so you can send it to me and then I'll share it next week and um, and that's what so you that took about a half um, 20 minutes to explain what's the how long does it take for the whole process to oh take my from beginning to end well let's think so skinning an animal might take something a size three hours mm -hmm. And then we have the to marmot. take, yep. So then we'd have to take it down. And the bones would probably, I'm thinking of how take long. Take about a week? Yeah, I'd say about a week yeah. for them to eat all that meat. A week to it. 10 days for a, a marmot, and then they'll come up in the box. And it takes me about two hours to get all the bones clean and into a clean box. And, and then uh, stuffing might take yeah. an hour or two, maybe like two weeks ish yeah. for something for that just one. For just one animal, so one it takes, animal. takes a long yeah. time. 
And of well, course, Chelsea, Chelsea and Bob, it's um, so nice to have you here and just show us a little bit, pulling back the curtain of behind the scenes, not just in terms of what we would see, but also what we, what our people are doing to make it to make it so. So thank you for your for your work, um, and and uh, we're so glad to have you here, and we're looking forward to having you back at the museum. Yeah, yeah we're looking forward to getting back there. Yeah. So. Um, we're going to stop the Facebook Live feed now, and we'll stop the official recording now, too. So goodbye.